So um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mike Phillips today and welcome everyone to this event with Mike to discuss the republication of his novel, The Dancing Face. Um, as we've heard, my name is Marcel Moncrief Johnson. I'm the LSBU Group Chief People Officer, and I'm delighted to be chairing this discussion this evening. So the format for the session is as follows. I'll introduce Mike, then Mike will read from The Dancing Face for about 20 minutes. Mike and I will then discuss some of the themes from the book and we'll then open up for questions for Mike from the audience. So let's start with some background on Mike. Mike Phillips was born in Guyana, but grew up in London. He worked for the BBC as a journalist and broadcaster on television programmes, including The Late Show and Omnibus, before becoming a lecturer in media studies at the University of Westminster. He's written many critically acclaimed crime novels, including Blood Rights, which was adapted for BBC television. The late candidate, winner of the Crime Writers Association, Silver Dagger for Fiction, as well as Point of Darkness, An Image to Die For, and A Shadow of Myself. Mike also co-wrote Windrush, The Irresistible Rise of Multiracial Britain, to accompany the BBC television series and, and an essay collection, London Crossings, a biography of Black Britain in 2001. Mike was appointed as the first cross-cultural curator for the Tate Galleries in 2005 and also wrote for The Guardian. Mike's public service includes trusteeship of the National Heritage Memorial Fund, and the Heritage Lottery Fund. And most recently, he served as an independent advisor to the Windrush Lessons Learned Review for the Home Office. The book, The Dancing Face, is very topical. Um, it's, it's about an art theft of a Benin mask that raises arguments about the legacy of imperialism, the nature of identity, and questions about reparations. As part of its republication, it comes with an original essay by Bernardine Evaristo, placing it in the context of Black British writing. I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Phillips, who will now read from The Dancing Face, uh, two chapters, chapter 17, which focuses on Dr. Akigbo, and chapter 19, which focuses on Justine. So welcome to Mike Phillips. Thank you. So. I'm reading chapter 17, which is focused on Dr. Akibo, who's one of the major characters in, in, in the novel. And he's a figure that really begins to shape the discussion about, um, about the dancing face, the, 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 the mask and its uh, quasi-religious context. Um, okay. Dr. Akibbo spent the night at his house in Ladbroke Grove. He didn't do this often, but it was the place he went to when he was specially anxious or bored. He thought of it as his safe house where he could retreat from the routine of his normal life and find the privacy to engage in some of his less decorous tastes. He'd actually bought the house for the periods when his children would be on vacation from the private schools they attended, the three boys in Surrey, the two big girls in Geneva. At these times, the house would be full of life with Akimbo reveling in the role of the almighty and forbearing father. Occasionally, when his patience was strained, he dispatched them all back to his first wife's house in Geneva. But in the general run of things, that house was a warm and happy place. The caretakers lived in the basement flat, which was completely isolated from the rest of the house and had a separate entrance. Akibbo called them caretakers because they guarded the house and did whatever little jobs he wanted. On the other hand, they weren't conventional servants, even by West African standards. Their names were Ola and Ogu. 
Okubo had been their patron ever since the days when he'd been a politician, a big man in the regional government. He'd hired them the first time to do a trifling job, a little stone throwing, no more. They'd been transients then, orphaned for a second time when the army they joined as teenagers reduced its numbers by half. And like thousands of their former comrades, they were at a loss with no family or prospects to which they could return. Even the village in the north that they called home had been blasted out of existence years before. Okigbo became their father, Babatundi. And while his star shone, there was something more than small men. Later, when it was time for Akibo to leave, it was Ola who drove him to the coast with Ogu perched in the passenger seat, nursing a Kalashnikov. Their loyalty turned out not to be misplaced because with Akibo gone, his protégés realized that their impunity had vanished and that it would be only a matter of time before they were arrested. Even so, it took them almost two years to make their way through North Africa into Europe. And they finally arrived in England, locked in a container with 11 Bangladeshis and three half-crazed Romanian women. When they contacted Okibo, he greeted them with amusement and the admiration a dog lover might display for a pet who had tracked him down over an impossible distance. There was also a measure of relief for him in seeing them again, partly because he was uncomfortable about relying exclusively on the mercenary services of the bodyguards he hired from an agency in London. On one occasion, they had tried his patience by actually sending him a female guard. After the first day, he got her removed, but, but even so, it was a symptom of their priorities, which made him feel insecure. With Ola and Ogu, he felt safe, and he moved them into the basement at Ladbrook Grove without delay. The only problem, as he told them, was that in this country, you had to have a sort of parallel identity written down on paper and kept in various files which proved your existence and justified your right to be alive in that time and place. Until he could ar arrange that, they had to live quietly, avoid calling attention to themselves and obey his instructions to the letter. So far, the pair had not disappointed him, but throughout the long night in which he waited for them to return with the dancing face, Okibo was haunted by the knowledge that even though they'd been in the country for over a year, their unfamiliarity with England and the English made them at best vulnerable and at worst, dangerously unpredictable. To keep these worries at bay, Akigbo prepared for a rare evening of domesticity, alone with Hadida. These occasions were unusual, partly because they were so precious to both of them. It had only been a few years earlier at the time when he was contemplating the prospect of permanent exile, that Okibo had understood how important Hadida was to him. It was then, while considering what arrangements he had to make, it struck him that it would be possible to leave everything behind, except for her. He had bought her at the age of seven or eight, and she wasn't certain which, on the Spice Coast near Mombasa. At the time, she was actually a refugee, a stranger to the, reading, to the region. According to the fisherman who had taken her to live with his family, she seemed to be a Deroda from Somalia. Her entire family had been killed by a mine or a bomb blast, and she'd walked quietly, attracting no attention until she reached the sea where she'd sat on the sand a little scrap of skin and bone waiting. What she was waiting for, she didn't know and no one could guess. The fisherman, a pious Muslim, had obeyed the precepts of the forest. Ah, the fisherman, a pious Muslim, had obeyed the precepts of the prophet, Aliyah, and taken the little stranger in. 
But a few months later, helping to pull in the nets, she'd caught the eye of an Arab trader who'd come dipping over the ocean in a pink sailed dhow full of carpets from Bukhara. Okibo, who was then working for the World Bank's Eastern Africa Fund, arrived on the dock in time to see the beginning of the transaction. On a whim, he interrupted the Arab and offered to take the child of Allah off the fisherman's hands. Okibo hadn't known exactly what he intended to do with the child. She worked in the house and lived with the other servants while he stayed on the coast. And he had her educated in a haphazard fashion because he had some idea that it would be useful if she could read and write English. When she was 15, he noticed that she was becoming a beauty, tall and graceful as a gliding snake alongside the swaggering buttocks of his native region's women. He married her in a Muslim ceremony. She was his fourth wife. Unlike the others, she failed to conceive, but this meant that she had nothing to distract her from focusing all her interest and affection on Okibo, the man who'd appeared from nowhere to give her new life. In his turn, Akiba had come to regard her as a treasure, a pearl plucked from the Indian Ocean, which he had discovered and reared and molded until she was almost a part of him. What he had not expected at the beginning was the extent to which Hadida would mold his own tastes. Years ago, while they were still on the coast, He'd revealed, she had revealed an unexpected gift for languages, which had been nurtured in the Islamic school where she first learned to read. At the same time, he discovered that the paper covered books she was reading at the end of the veranda were Nayyirare Swahili translations of Shakespeare. And that night, he made her begin reading aloud to him from the pile of books beside her bed. During the long, soft nights, She'd read him Shaban stories and the Mashiri, uh, the epic verses of Al Ghazani and Ahmad Nasir. On such nights, he would lie sprawled on a bed strewn with rose petals, every shift of his block, every shift of his bulk, bruising a tiny, fragile skin, while Hadida's voice lulled him into sleep. He was sleeping like this when Ola and Ogu returned. Hadida woke him at once because it was already late. Ola had got lost on the way back to London and the journey had taken twice the time that it should have. When the two men finished their story, Okibo questioned them about the details, how they'd been lured to the club, the sudden appearance of the policewoman, whether they'd mentioned his name. Afterwards, he dismissed them calmly enough but below his assumed composure, he was raging with anger and frustration. He didn't receive the letter until he returned to his flat. He left Hadida at the house and stepped into the waiting car without a word to Chris. But the chauffeur, who knew his employer's moods and habits, simply drove him back to Kensington without asking for instructions. On the way, Akibo tried to concentrate on the problem. Part of his anger was directed at himself for being so naive as to think that the mouse could be secured simply by intimidating the boy. Reflecting on his own actions in the matter, he understood that he had underestimated the brothers because of what they were, and he had assumed they could be handled by Ola and Ogu, men who were also rootless and desperate orphans. So his contempt had overtaken and swamped his good sense. He closed his eyes to blot out the sight of the slate gray of the wet pavements and the puffs of blue smoke circulating in the traffic haze. Flickering in his mind were other mornings into which he'd floated on the perfume of fresh green kif, on the horizon, a slice of red sun rising out of the sea, the feathery wearing of Parrot's wings mingling in his memory with the murmuring of Hadida's voice. 
The letter was waiting for him in the hallway of his flat. Enclosed was a picture of the dancing face propped against the blank wall. In front of it, partly covering its lower half, was a newspaper, carefully, carefully folded to show the date. There was no message. Akiba studied the picture with a feeling of relief. His spirits lifted. For the last year hour, he'd faced the prospect that the mask had been destroyed or permanently lost, or that locating it would require an exhaustive and unpleasant investigation. Instead, the problem had resolved itself into a simple one of negotiation. He didn't know who his opponent was, but that didn't matter. He had negotiated some of, with some of the most unreasonable people in the world in circumstances which were very much less promising. The telephone rang, the tape clicked on, and Okibo recognized the voice immediately. If you got my letter, she said, you'll know that I've got it. I'm glad to hear it, Okibo said, but we have to meet and talk about this. There's nothing to say. You got a lot out of me already. I've done exactly what you asked for and I've got nothing to show for it. Now it's my turn and I'm not messing around with you. You know exactly what I want. I know what you want, Akibo told her patiently, but all I have here is a picture. You could have got it from someone else. If I have to negotiate with other people, it will be difficult enough. What you're asking is not easy. I have to say that I've seen it. I have to be confident in what I'm doing. We have to trust each other. I wouldn't trust you as far as I can throw you, she said. Okay, now I'm going to chapter 19, which focuses on Justine, who is the person um, that's trying to uh, get the mask from Okibo. Um, and in the last chapter, she, she says she's got it. And now she's meeting Okibo to discuss it. On the way to her meeting with Okibo, Justine thought about her father. She'd seen him last when they parted in Lagos. As she turned to wave goodbye, he'd been putting away his wallet. Beside him, an official, the uniformed man who had flipped through her passport, was holding a bundle of Naira, which she guessed had come from her father. They were both smiling broadly. This was how she remembered him. At the center of an aura of mystery and threat, his expression cheerful and untroubled. When she tracked backwards through her memories of him, it struck her that she'd always felt this way. For instance, when they arrived back in Lagos, he'd taken her to St. Mary's for an interview. At first she thought this was an odd choice because neither of her parents had ever been Catholics and she knew nothing about the religion. But when she mentioned this to her dad, he'd simply smiled and said, don't worry. They'd gone to the school without discussing it any further. But once past the wrought iron gates, she'd felt a change in him. He seemed to have become bigger and more jovial with an air of command, which had been weaving itself about him since they'd got off the plane. Justine had noticed it before on the second day when their chauffeur was late. And her dad had spoken to him in a peremptory tone she'd never heard him use in England. She was just getting used to the idea of having a chauffeur and a cook, looking at them timidly and wondering how they would react if she dared ask them to do anything. Her father, by contrast, seemed to have no inhibitions whatsoever about ordering them around, clicking his tongue and looking about impatiently if they were out of earshot of whatever requests he wanted to make. On the day of the interview, she felt this impatience about him as he sat behind her, facing the nuns, an uneasy vibration in the air like a dam about to burst. There were two of them, a black woman dressed in black robes and a white woman in blue dress 
who spoke with a French accent and had sly green eyes. The nun, who she later learned to call sister, asked simple questions about her schooling, but she kept looking at Justine's dad. The French woman, who also turned out to be a nun, said nothing, but she too kept her eyes on Dr. Oe Banjo. Later, Justine grew accustomed to people treating him with a certain obsequiousness, which he called respect. Sometimes when she was with him in a village outside the capital, men would come to the house and lower themselves to the floor as if about to do push-ups at his feet. The first time she saw someone do this, she remembered that her father was some kind of hereditary chief. But when she asked him what it meant, he laughed and told her it was meaningless. The people who called him chief, he said, were a tiny subgroup within a larger population and they'd long been scattered. Their villages dispersed even before the civil war. His own father, along with the rest of his closest relatives, had been killed in one night of disorder during a distant election campaign. There'd been nothing left, not even the land. These men who bowed down before him were old men, he said, who'd known his father and wanted to pay him respect. Justine had in any case been intrigued, but unworried. When her father talked about these events, it was clear they were history. And sometimes she knew, she even felt a kind of relief that there were no close relatives to accommodate. In England, when her father broke the news that he'd been offered an important job back home, as he called Nigeria, and that they were gonna live there, she felt as if a great jagged tear was about to rip through her life. One of the fears which haunted her all the while they were preparing to go away was that isolated in this foreign place, she would be unable to remember or think of her mother. The images which crossed her mind were of herself, picking a path along jungle trails or squatting shoeless in a dusty village street. But there had been nothing like anything she imagined. The convent had been a place of grass, flowers, and the sound of water, verdant behind the high walls, which kept out the baked earth and dust of the town. Her classmates, she discovered, were also mainly the daughters of big men, one or two of them government officials, at whose names faces stiffened and went blank. When she walked through the busy streets or in a market, she felt armored, protected by the uniform of navy blue and white, which declared her to be from St. Mary's, the child of an important family. Within a matter of months, she'd forgotten all about her previous fears and the dust, the heat, the sun's glare, which had begun to burn a dark film into her flesh all seemed as normal as an English autumn. Her father's pleasure at the speed with which she settled into her new life was immense, and they grew closer and more familiar than they had ever been. Sometimes he came to watch her playing hockey. The field was bordered by a tall wire fence, and whenever the girls played there, there would be a line of spectators along the fence. Among them, were the permanent fixtures, a couple of stall holders and half a dozen beggars, tin cups clutched in hand, working through the crowd, which the schoolgirls' presents delivered to them twice a week. Most of them were men, transported by the sight of the schoolgirls' bodies, which in that place had the exotic foreign look of magazine models, slim and hardened as they were by the convent's regulated diet and the constant bouts of exercise. Justin's father was one of the few parents who ever came to watch, stepping out of his car by the side of the street and preceded by his chauffeur, officiously brushing the spectators aside to create a space where the doctor could stand and view the play undisturbed. At such times, the volume of noise would drop suddenly as if someone had turned the knob. The cat calls of advice, jokes, and howls of lust would be replaced by silence for a few minutes. And when the noise returned, it would be at a quieter, more subdued level, which on the field was more or less drowned out by the thwack of the sticks and the shouting of the players. 
afterwards, Justine's father would take her to a hotel for tea or a glass of imported fizz. Walking towards the middle of Waterloo Bridge, she thought now of the smell of her father's aftershave, something lemony, a fresh clean tang, which always felt like standing under a shower. The streams of clear water smack into, smacking into her face until she threw her head back, gasping for breath. Oh, daddy, she almost said aloud, gripped once again by the fear that she was too late, that all this would be for nothing. Akibo was already waiting, standing by the rail, his hands resting lightly on it, looking out over the river. He wore dark glasses, a black and white check jacket, and light gray trousers. As usual, he looked immaculate. It was not long after lunchtime, and in the chill sunshine, there was a thin stream of people crossing the bridge on foot. Several of them were tourists who, as they trudged past on the pavement, risked a quick glance to see what it was that this elegant black man was staring at so intently. Okibo ignored them, his pose as still as a statue. But as Justine approached, he turned and smiled broadly. Tactful as ever, he didn't move or make any attempt to touch her in greeting. I'm glad you picked this spot, he said. It's been too long since I came here. Earth has not anything to show more fair. She guessed that this was his way of teasing her. She picked the middle of the bridge because she would be able to see in either direction so as to make sure that he was alone before approaching him. And she was certain that he knew this. That was Westminster Bridge, she said automatically. A kibber laughed. Yes, <laughs> they taught you well at St. Mary's. Oh, leave off, Justine cried impatiently. You wanted to talk, that's why I'm here. I was hoping, Akiba said, that we could talk about your conditions. You know what my conditions are. I want you to go to the High Commission or to those oil company friends of yours and negotiate for me. I want to hear from my dad, a letter or something that will tell me he's alive. And then I want him out and sent to another country. Then you'll get the mask. I'm not sure it can be done. Justine laughed heartily. I'm sure it can. They faced each other. Justine's stare, defiant and angry, daring him. Why are you like this to me? Okibo asked. Your father and I were like brothers. That was true enough, Justine thought. The first time she met Okibo, had been when her father took her out after school. He'd risen from where he was sitting on the veranda of the hotel and greeted her warmly, holding her, her hand in both of his. What a beautiful child, he said, a rose. Her father laughed, pleased at his compliments. Welcome, Okibo told Justine, welcome to your home. Various relatives have been saying things like this for a couple of months, but when Okibo said it, he made it sound as if he was making her a gift. And suddenly she'd felt that it was true. This was now her home. Even when later on she set out for England, she'd still been certain of her return. You wouldn't leave your brother sitting in prison for over three years, she said. A kibble sighed. If you got it, he murmured you can negotiate for yourself. No, I can't. You know I can't. More than three years must have passed since she received the letter from her father. He'd written to say that he'd been arrested and was about to be tried. In the rest of the letter, he told her that he loved her, that he was proud of her, and all she'd achieve. Then he warned her not to come, not to waste time trying to get him released because it would be useless. The charges had no grounds, he wrote, and he would be released or not. Outside intervention would simply make things worse. That was the last time she'd heard from him. Disobeying his instructions, she caught the first plane she could. In her imagination, she pictured herself talking with her father through prison bars. She suspected that what he'd said in his letter was true. 
that there was nothing she could do, but at least she wanted to see him. Perhaps she kept thinking it had all been a mistake, caught up in a flurry of arrests in the latest upheaval, he would perhaps been released already and he would be sitting in his car outside the airport, ready to scold her for doing exactly what he told her not to do. At the airport, there was no one to meet her. She went to the house of her cousin, Uma. He was a health inspector, a post which her father had been instrumental in obtaining for him, but he greeted her in a matter of fact way and showed no sign of distress or grief about what had happened. The charges against the doctor, he explained, were a result of his business activities. He'd been involved with a group of investors in the North who were accused of embezzlement and corruption. There had, as yet, been no trial and no one knew where he was being held. During the next few weeks, Justine made a tour of the ministry, the British High Commission, and of all, the important men she could remember her father knowing. Most of them refused to see her. When she went to see a kibbo, she was told he was out. When she returned on the next day, she was just in time to see his car emerging from the drive. In the back seat, he looked straight at her, smiled and turned away. By this time, Justine was incapable of surprise. In fact, she already knew that events of this kind hardly ever broke the surface of normal life. At St. Mary's, all talk of politics had been discouraged. During her classes on the French Revolution, Sister Mary Redemption had told them firmly more than once, our business here is education, not political debate. In Justine's second year at the school, a general whose two daughters were in her class had been arrested for plotting a coup. No one had spoken about it. And the two girls, isolated by their bewilderment and grief, began to take on the appearance of pariahs, wandering the corridors hand in hand, their group of friends dropping away until a fortnight later they vanished. It was as if her father had vanished in the same way, diminishing gradually to a small dot in the corner of the picture to be removed sometime later, casually and without reflection. Growing reckless, she haunted the ministry, telephoned journalists and foreign advisors, visited the clubs and hotels where senior officers enjoyed their leisure. None of it did any good. What she heard was that most people believed her father's associates to have been thoroughly corrupt. But in that, they were no different to many other men of business who were allowed to conduct their affairs undisturbed. The real answer she began to believe was that Dr. Oyubanjo had publicly committed himself to a campaign for free elections and a return to civilian rule. From that time on, he was walking a tightrope. In the circumstances, her efforts were bound to be in vain and running out of money she'd given up and returned to England. It was a couple of years later that Okibo had contacted her. You know that I can't negotiate with them, she said. The point was that they wouldn't be able to take her seriously. She had no illusions about that. She was foreign, a half-breed and a woman. Everywhere in the country, she'd met with warmth and welcoming smiles. People would like her. To. Frankly, they were curious and charmed by her pale color and her exotic eyes. She threatened nothing and no one. If you were a visitor or had no serious tasks to perform, this made for a pleasant and agreeable life. If you were interested in making things happen, it was an immovable barrier. In the continuing cycle of conflict, the real enemies were men who almost shared the same blood. And the other side of the coin was that between them, they also shared the same pools of influence and fought over the same chances of power. In their hands, the levers of the state were moved and shaken. The Cuba was one of them. If I can get a message from your father, he said. I want to see his handwriting, Justine interrupted. 
then I want him out. And in another country, Benin, Togo, Ghana, even Chad will do. But Kibble screws his face up. I don't know. Justine's patience was gone. I know you can do it. Her voice was shrill, carried by the wind, and a little group of fat white Americans strolling ponderously past turned to look. You still have that much power, she continued, bringing her voice under control. Perhaps if my dad was really important, it might be impossible, but I don't know what happened. He's just a fucking number who got lost and they're too embarrassed or uninterested to let him go. Or there's some petty provincial sadist whose idea of fun this is. You know that, you've done as much yourself. He frowned, looking past her over his shoulder. And she spun her head rapidly to see whether one of his men had come onto the bridge. But there were no black faces there, no one except the usual plodding file of white office workers and tourists. You don't need to be nervous, he said. You can trust me. Those were more or less the same words that he'd used when he telephoned her that first time at her office. He had taken her to dinner at a hotel near Oxford Circus, where a uniformed flunky had leapt to hold the, car the door open as they stepped down from the car. She was as impressed as he intended her to be. And over dinner, he told her that he had a plan to get her father out. It required her help, he said, but he would have to withhold the details until he was sure of her complete commitment. Halfway through the dessert, he told her what he wanted. He'd always liked her, and she would have to sleep with him before he could continue with his proposition. Justine had received such proposals a number of times from various men, including her cousin Uma, during her ordeal in Lagos. The difference about this one was that she believed it, and she believed too that Okibo's vanity and his sense of self-protection required this guarantee. It was only later that she realized that he needed to know how far she would go. She walked out on him that night, but by the time she was incredibly, but by that time, she was incredibly twice as desperate as she'd been two years previously. And at their second meeting, she agreed. She'd gone to bed with him reluctantly, forcing, him, forcing herself to relax as he touched her with the thought that she was doing it for her dad. A couple of hours later, Hadida knocked on the door and came in with a tray of tea steaming with the scent of jasmine. Calmly, Akibo remarked, that it was her custom to watch over him through the half-open door when there was a guest present in his room. While they drank tea, Akibo told her about his plans for the dancing face and explained that he wanted her to become Gus's companion so there would be no prospect of the mask escaping his grasp. That was several months ago. But hearing him repeat the phrase about trust reminded her again about how much she'd begun to hate and distrust him. It wasn't as if she'd ever seen him as trustworthy, but the strength of her present resentment was recent. It, it dated back to a couple of months previously, after she had found out something which altered everything about the way she felt towards him. It had come up while she was having lunch with one of the attaches at the High Commission, a brother of one of the girls with whom she'd been at school in Lagos. Talking about the reception he'd attended the night before, he had mentioned seeing Okibo, your father's good friend, he'd said, giving the words a sarcastic twist. She'd asked him what he meant by his manner. And when he tried to shrug it off, she persisted. He'd looked over his shoulder as if to make certain he wasn't overheard. Then he told her, Akibo was the director of the business that your father invested in. He was one of the big boys who got away. It was a small fish like your father who got caught in the net. He gestured, that's how it is. Why did no one tell me before now, Justine asked. She thought of her cousin Uma and the conversation they'd had about her father's trouble. He'd never mentioned this, if he knew. The attaché looked embarrassed. 
Everyone thought you knew. She understood. Truth was what emerged from a balance of various forces and interests. Everyone had assumed that she was engaged in complex negotiations about her father's fate and to rub her, rub her nose in inconvenient facts would have been impolite and perhaps cruel. It was after this that Justine decided to make her own arrangements for the mask. I don't trust anyone, she said mechanically. She looked at her watch, three o'clock. Along the river, Big Ben began to chime the hour. Our original agreement, Akibo told her calmly, was that I would get him out when I got back. And for that, I need the dancing face. But you don't need it to get my dad out. I don't want to wait anymore and I don't trust you. If I give it to you now, you've got no incentive, have you? She remembered something. That day in Lagos, you saw me, didn't you? You drove right past. You recognized me and you smiled, but you wouldn't even talk to me. She saw from his face that she was right. And all of a sudden her rage and suspicion boiled to a climax. Well, screw you. You get me my dad and I'll bring you the mask. Otherwise, no deal. A taxi drew up alongside the pavement next to her and the driver reached out to thrust the door open as he stopped. She turned, stepped away from the keyboard and got in. This was exactly how she'd arranged it. And even though the taxi was a minute late, she felt a lift of elation at how smoothly it had worked. As they pulled out into the traffic, she glanced back to see the look on Akibo's face, but he turned away and was standing still once more, staring out over the river. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Mike. Um, it really was a pleasure. Interesting. Um, really enjoyed listening um, to you reading those two chapters and that really sets the scene nicely for us to um, have a conversation um, about your book. Um, and I, I guess the first thing I wanted to start with was just to um, perhaps ask you to explain why you read those two chapters specifically. What is it that you wanted us to understand uh, about the context <clears throat> of the book um, okay. and the background? I, I, mm -hmm. Let's leave the background for a moment. And I wanted the reader to understand just how complex the whole thing was. That for Justine, it was it was hopefully a way of getting her father back and out of prison. Akibo. Um, was a different, more complex character. He wanted, he wants the mask because he wants to be able to blackmail his associates, the oil companies, uh, the politicians back home and so on, yeah? Um, so he doesn't really much care what Justine wants. He just wants her to do what, he tells her. Um, and I, I wanted to get over that actually this book is it, full of people whose motives are mixed up, messed up, and that it ends in hard questions. Yeah, it, it, it's not a simple, good, bad, you, you know, it's, it's really complex. And um, I, I, I read those pieces be, because I, I wanted to get over that what was central to the book, um, deep inside the, 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 the argument about reparations and so on, what was central to the book was the, the moral issues, the fact that, um, the, the fact that, Colonialism had left a lot of disasters in its train, but it wasn't it wasn't an exclusive evil, as it were. 
you know that that there were lots of things um there are lots of things in the in the previous african empire which um were also a, a problem and um you know the relations be between men and women there's sort of all kinds of corruption and so on and I, I want to hopefully to get that over in those two chapters yes and i think i think you definitely did and i think there's a there's a deep complexity to all of those issues and, and how you bring those issues to life uh, in a book such as this um could you could you tell us a bit about how the book came to be um, republished and, and what you really think of as being rediscovered as a pioneer of Black British writing? Oh, well, I, I, have, I have to be grateful to um, Bernardina Faristo. Um, I, I knew Bernadine, God, years ago uh, when she was writing, when she was writing her first book. And, and, and in fact, um, I, uh, I, I, I contributed something to the cover of, of that at, at the time. And um, she used to come and see me when I was working at the, at the festival, Royal Festival Hall. I, I was resident writer. And, um, she used to come and see me, which was just like really the start of her writing um, life. So I, 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 I presume when when she rang me and and said she was doing this, she was doing drawing up this list. Um, I I was really I was really pleased and 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 thankful that she thought of me. Brilliant. That's an interesting story. And it's, uh, it's I guess it's networking. And it's also about um, her knowing of your work previously, um, and, and that resonating with her. And I mean, the, the dancing face is, is such a, a resonant story of our times, but it was written over 25 years ago. Could you give us an idea about where the story came from? Oh. First, let, let, let me say, when, when, when you said it was written over 25 years ago, the, the truth is, yes, but I, I, I feel now that that's a bit of a disaster in itself, that so much of our lives, and so I'm looking at you and me, um, yeah. be, 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 because we, we, we operate or within the same kind of platform, as it were, academics um, and black British, and um, I, I, I find it sort of distressing that things haven't changed as much for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, uh, it, even though I was going through the same experience 25 years ago, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what what I what 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 I um, thought about uh, mm, I, I I need to think a little bit. I got I got um, diverted. <laughs> Tell oh. <laughs> ask me the question again. Um, so it's just the, the the dancing face, you know. It's such a it's a resonant story for our times, but it was written oh, over yeah. twenty five years ago. So it was just about telling us where the idea for the story came from, and also the fact that it's so pertinent today, which you'd, you'd started to to comment on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I got the idea from. I mean, there's a, there's a story I, I I always remember. I suspect there's other things, but I I had a friend, um, Stephen, and uh, he came to see me one night. I was um, 
one rainy night, it was always raining. Um, he came to see me at the Royal Festival Hall and uh, we were talking. No, not the Royal Festival Hall, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was teaching at the time at um, Polytechnic of Central London and he, he used to walk past my window and um, he, he was working for an African millionaire. And, uh, and uh, he, was, he used to come past and tell me weird stories about this guy and all the things he did. And um, I, I remember on one occasion, um, there'd been a mix up in the office and uh, one of this guy's ships had um, had been somehow lost in uh, in the Indian Ocean, and he'd been very angry. And he said to the guy responsible, "If we were back home, I would have you killed." <laughs> <laughs> And um, I started writing it then. <laughs> <laughs> I it, it struck that. me as yeah. so, there were so many things implicit in, in that yeah. notion, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and it was really complicated at that point, thinking about, um, on the one hand, um, this African guy I was thinking about. Um, on the other hand, I was thinking about um, not reparating. I, I was kind of thinking about um, African cultural artifacts, yeah. which had wound up in the British Museum or, 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 or wherever. And um, I didn't actually know that I was going, I was going to work as a curator <laughs> for the Tate <laughs> Galleries at the time. This was uh, about a year before that. But I, I was interested in, I was interested in that situation. I was mm. interested in what what was happening to those particular treasures. And I was, you know, I re reading West African history and so on. So uh, it was a kind of development. Um, and I was, I was trying to get away from the writing I'd been doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd been specializing in um, creating a detective. Yeah. And I thought, oh, bugger this. I'm not really, I'm, I'm not really interested in, um, cre you know, creating crimes for him to solve anymore. Um, I, I wanted something that spoke to, that spoke to different issues. Yeah. Um, and that, that was the dancing phase. Brilliant. Thank you for that explanation. And that gives us a bit more <laughs> insight um, into where some sorry, of those sorry, ideas so... come from. No, that, that, that's good. It's good to get that insight from you. Um, I'll ask, I think I'll ask one more question just so that I can um, give the audience a chance for um, a Q and A. But the, the story um, starts when Gus loses patience with what he says are the increasingly pointless methods of the Committee for Reparations to Africa. He argues that nothing will change without direct action. And um, from your perspective, after 
Black Lives Matter, and you've mentioned that, you know, you don't think things have changed much, but after Black Lives Matter and the increasing um, awareness um, of the, the lived experiences um, of Black people in the UK and around the world, um, do you think something has changed potentially in your view? Yes, yes, of course something has changed. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I was, uh, I, I was a bit hasty in saying nothing has changed, and I, I don't mean that. And uh, quite a lot has changed. When I walk along the road, I can see um, how much has changed. Um, so please for, forget that statement. <laughs> but. <laughs> but that's not that's really not the issue i i think when i when i started writing about um when i started writing about the dancing phase let, let, let me be honest i really wasn't thinking about it in this in in the terms that you talked about. Mm. I was thinking about it um, in simple terms like, oh, what would happen if? <laughs> um, and uh, the thing that I kind of started with, the thing I started thinking about with the dancing phase, was actually Danny, the student, mm. the, the brother. And I was thinking, I, I was kind of putting down some of my own experience being a student, <laughs> you know, year, years previously. But um, I was thinking about um, what things were like then and um what would move him out of that and backwards and forwards you know it, it it was it was something that to me uh kind of uh, kind of represented and and stood for my life in in britain um and uh what was really nice and useful about it was the sense that I could use the dancing face, I, I could, and I could use that whole argument um, as a way of creating an imagery about the, the, the life that me and my mom and dad and son had lived and um, what might happen next. Um, so <sighs> thinking about Black Lives Matter, um, when, when I, again, when I said, I don't think anything had changed or what, whatever it was I, I, I said, I, I didn't quite mean that. I, I think people have to do something in order for anything to change. And, and you can't, I, I don't think you can honestly and sincerely um, criticize uh, what people do to protest or what, what, whatever, because be, because all of it, whether successful or unsuccessful, all of it speaks to us. All of it says, here is your life. How are you going to deal with it? Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I'm not sure what's happening post BLM. Yes. <laughs> um, but I am sure that actually I'm very glad that the young people taking that business of um, action to 
de define and redefine themselves ser seriously. Yeah. When 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 I wrote Dancing Face, that wasn't on the agenda at all. Mm. It wasn't something we we and by by we I mean my friends and I and, and so on. We talked about it, mm. but we talked about it. You, you know, like um, just as a, a, it was almost a fantasy that we couldn't imagine. Couldn't imagine that one day uh, young people would be out waving banners and shouting about reparations. Couldn't imagine it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we would advocate it and talk about, but but you you, you know, if if there was a hundred people, it would be like three and a half of us, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of yeah. um, complaining and, and waving sport, banners. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for um for sharing those insights um with me. I'm conscious of the time and that we want to um get to some of the questions in the chat and um some uh, questions from our audience. So I'll ask um Dean to uh, lead on on those discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcel. So yeah, we got a few questions here. Um to you, Mike. So one here is from Tony. Um, and asks, what do you think if someone wants to adapt your piece into a film? What do I think, Tony? I, I, the, the, to begin with, um, to begin with, you wonder how much they're going to pay. Um, because uh, it's like, um, oh, I wrote this 25 years ago, and I've been waiting for the payday. <laughs> and, and I'm actually not being flippant, because one of the things that you realize is that when you're a writer or an artist of some sort, you're working all the time. You're working all the time um, to produce something. When you produced it, uh, you really tend not to be rewarded um, in, a, uh, in, in a commensurate manner. Um, so uh, I think about the money. Um, and I suppose I also think about just how they're going to do it. What, what does it mean? What, what kind of um, what kind of approach they'll they'll take, and then um, I suppose there, there, there's other things, um, but I I think um, you, you know once you get past the the, the nature of the sale, um, what what sort of matters is just exactly what they'll do. Exactly, having the creative control as well as getting the right fees for it. That would be that's right. Perfect uh, combination. There. Amazing. Okay, so got another question here from Kate. Um, brothers seem important in the novel. Uh, what is it about brothers that works here in the story? What is there about brothers that works in the story? I think um, it's something to do with the sense, it's, it's something to do with uh, what came before you and what's coming after. So, and, and you think of, um, I suppose, in, in, in the book, um, those two guys, uh, Danny and Gus, had the sense that it was just them, just the two of them, um, that somehow they were together, somehow they were making something in, in, in the world 
um, and in in a way that represented both themselves and and the parents they'd lost. And um, being being brothers was symbolic of that. So when one of them uh, one of them died, it it left a huge it left a huge missing missing hole in um, a big gap in in uh, the in the soul of the younger one. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting to hear. And yeah, I've got a brother myself, and it's always you always have that special connection with your brother. So it's always good to hear the author expand on that as well it's really helped really nice um another question here will you ever write another crime novel oh my goodness me uh, <laughs> yes i will um look i'm i'm not sure that um everything i've i've written is crime fiction and in, in in a way you you sit down and you begin to write and um the what you're writing kind of defines itself you know um you you can't you can't stop it and uh you can't quite make it happen um I'm, I'm i'm sorry that this is difficult to describe but but um i i would begin writing let's say um and uh i wouldn't know until the end of the first chapter or something like that just where it's going to go i find i find it difficult to sort of I, I i can't i was going to say i don't but 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 i can't plan and structure um from the beginning to the end although you know it appears structured and planned but i don't feel like that yes so uh, apologies for that um I, I didn't say the name so it was io that was uh the person who um asked that question uh, so he, I was, uh, mentioned that he's known, known, you, known you since uh, from the Crime Rights Association. That's what uh, that's where the question comes from in that sense. Oh, really? What's his name? I, uh, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, so the next question is from Fian. Uh, so what advice would you give to aspiring writers who want to write about issues in the same way you did in The Dancing Face? look write in the way that you want um write in the in the way that makes sense to you that expresses something about you when i wrote the dancing face honestly i wasn't thinking about it in the way that we're talking about it and discussing it now some some other parts of the dancing face that mean a, quite a lot to me now just really didn't have that same resonance you, you know the death of Gus and the way that Danny felt was um, I, I, I'm now not quite sure where that came from <laughs> so I think that you actually have to put yourself in the book and and write it okay um that's great uh, so at the moment we, oh wait, let me see if we've got another question that just came through yes we do from jennifer so do you think the way of this uh this warrior writes in is in a way different to people that have brought up in a more uh eurocentric way oh boy yes Yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, tell me, um, 
Jenny, what 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 do you mean by Eurocentric exactly? So so it's just a question that's come through from Jennifer. So um, maybe just wait a couple of seconds for Jennifer, Jennifer to respond on that, uh, just because it's on the Zoom webinar. Uh, don't have the uh, won't be able to get the back and forth at this time. Uh, read, 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 read the question again. Huh? Not a problem. So, do you think the way of uh, diaspora, uh, diaspora uh, rights rights is in a different way to people that have been brought up in a more Eurocentric way? Oh, so I, I think it's, sorry, it's Marcel the, here. I think it's I think the questions about um, whether whether people from the diaspora write in a different way to people that have been brought up in a more Eurocentric way. So I think it's um, people of, of, of black and ethnic heritage. Are we writing differently um, as to those that were, were brought up maybe in, in, in the UK and, and other countries? Yes, I, <laughs> I, I think when I, when I was writing this, um, that, that was a that was a thought that almost tormented me a bit, because I, I wanted I, I wanted the characters and the narrative to be sort of um, married up um, in in a in a way that that wasn't like um, I didn't want to sound like Graham Greene. Or you know, I didn't want to sound like Walt Mosley. Um, I want, I, I'm, I wanted to sound like um, a black British writer. I wanted to sound like someone who had grown up in, uh, had grown up in Islington and Arangay. but. I, I I didn't want to sound um, exactly <laughs> like someone who'd grown up in in Harringay. Um, I wanted to sound like me, and um, I, I was I was continually struck by this problem. How how do I structure language? in order to sound like myself rather than somebody else. Uh, I don't know the answer to that one, ex except to say that I'm certain it's, it's the case that if you're writing, honestly, what's, what's in your head, what's inside you, um, you are going to sound different. You are going to sound like a, a different person. You, you, you'll even, um, it, 10 years, 20 years between you, you'll sound different to some, to your children. Definitely, there's really good points to make. Um, we don't have any more questions from the audience, but we do have some questions submitted from the LSBU English and Creative Writing students. So uh, I've got a couple here. Um, did you did the book require research on masks and the British Museum security system? Uh, 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 oh, a, a, a little bit. The, 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 the thing is that these were issues that I grew up thinking and talking with my friends about. Um, I, I would, as 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 a young guy, um, be talking about things like um, you, you know African history and and so on uh, in 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 a in a relatively casual way. Um, I, I remember writing. Um, writing a, a chapter for the British, British Museum, no, no, British Library, um, which, which is still up. It's, it's about, it's, I think it's called Black Britons or something like that. 
Um, and it's about a number of people, Black Europeans, a number of people who grew up and did quite important things in Europe and, and in Britain. And uh, the thing was, you know, we, we talked about those things all, all the time. My, my friends, my friends weren't, um, <laughs> my friends were literate people. Um, and those were the things that interested them um, as, as young black, you know, academics or, or, or whatever. We, we really had to, we, we really, work through those things that interested us. Um, so the, it, it didn't require a huge amount of research. Um, and the, the thing about the security, um, very difficult that one, um, 25 years ago, uh, you could walk into some of the places I worked and walk out with anything. <laughs> um, so I didn't have to do a, a lot of research. I, um, I, I think, I, I, again, talking to people, I, um, I, I think um, the head of security at um, Tate Galleries, for for instance, um, you would talk, have having a drink or standing around having a fag, and um, you talk about what the problems were or something like that. Uh, so uh, I never thought about it um, as. Uh, exhausting research but clear, clearly there was some research amazing thank you and i think the last question we're going to leave just because we run up to time uh is just another question from jennifer that we just received here so she wants to firstly say your answer to the question that she presented before was perfect um would you be be able to do another session again i think your expertise is needed uh needed today oh i would love to <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah it's um creative writing it's um yeah it's the sort of thing that i would have loved to be doing 30 years ago amazing thank, thank you. you thank you mike um it's going to pass you back to Marcel, who will be delivering our closing statements for today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean, and thank you, Mike. Um, so Sorry so if I embarrassed you, Marcel. Oh, not at all. Was I was supposed oh. to be embarrassed about something. <laughs> I missed it, so, so that's absolutely fine. Um, okay. Just to say that uh, this event was sponsored by Equinet, um, which is the Black and Minority Ethnic Staff Network for London South Bank University. Um, and I'm the executive sponsor for Equinet. Um, and the chair is Shaminda Takar, who organized this event. So thank you very much to Shaminda and the team. Thanks to Dean for hosting us today. Day. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Jenny Owen for all of your research and your questions. Last but not least, um, thank you to Mike Phillips for sharing your novel with us, uh, for the brilliant uh, reading at the, the top of the session, for being so open and frank, um, and for, for really sharing with us this story and, and, and letting us all see that perspective. And it's just amazing that, that the book is so relevant. So we're extremely pleased to have you and thank you so much. And again, thank you to our audience. Um, thank you for your listening ears, for your interesting questions. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the session today and have a lovely evening. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>